morning we're going to have a talk on Pediatric Stroke Trials and Tribulations by Dr. Anna Errett, our inaugural graduate of the Pediatric Neurology Residency Program here at UofL, for which we have a 100% board pass rate. <laughs> anyway, and so we're very excited to hear about this, and I expect that I'll be learning quite a bit. Thank you, Anna. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Can you guys hear me okay? I don't have a pocket for the microphone, so I'd rather not hold it if that's okay. Can you hear me in the blue? Yeah, you can beside him, so that's good. All right, good stuff. Um, <clears throat> I have nothing to disclose. Very important. Um, so just a little history on stroke. So Hippocrates, of course, the father of medicine, first recognized stroke 2,400 years ago. At that point, he called it apoplexy, which means struck down by violence, because obviously there would be a, um, a sudden change in the neurologic status, and the patient would have this neurologic deficit thereafter. Of course, at that time, there was poor understanding of the anatomy or the function of the brain, and people didn't understand why it happened or how to treat it, so it was just a, a vague apoplexy at that time. And then in the 1600s, Jacob Wepfer discovered that there was bleeding on the brain um, and many of those who died. He also discovered that a blockage in one's vessels could cause this apoplexy. So today we're just going to discuss a little bit about epidemiology. We're going to talk about the presentation of stroke in children, how you might work that up, possible management of stroke in children. We're going to spend quite a bit of time looking at the risk factors because they are vast. Um, we want to look through some of the trials and literature that are current and that have helped shape the management today. And we're going to look at a few case presentations today. And so for the layman, the stroke is essentially the loss of blood and oxygen to the brain, resulting in the death of, cell, of nerve cells or brain cells. The WHO classification... Um, is a clinical syndrome of rapidly developing focal or global disturbance of brain, the brain functioning, lasting more than 24 hours or leading to death with no obvious non-vascular cause. Well, this definition is a little bit difficult for children because several of our patients that present with obvious changes on the MRI, with obvious acute neurologic deficits, their deficits a lot of times will resolve within 24 hours. So according to this definition, we couldn't necessarily say stroke, but we do. Of course, stroke can be classified in different ways. There's the arterial ischemic stroke, which is what I tend to think of when I think of stroke, probably because I'm a neurologist. Most of the times if there's a hemorrhagic stroke, um, whether it's due to subarachnoid hemorrhage or another intracerebral bleed, um, usually neurosurgery takes care of those patients, so I tend to think about those a little bit less. But in children, they actually make up 50% of the strokes. You can have the sinus venous thrombosis, cerebral sinovenous thrombosis. So um, when you think about strokes in children, there can be some different classifications. There's a neonatal stroke and a perinatal stroke with some subtle differences there. The neonatal stroke could be from early gestation up until the first month of life. Whereas a perinatal stroke is anywhere from approximately 28 weeks of gestation until seven days. However, some will include up to 28 days of life. Approximately 30% of pediatric strokes remain idiopathic. I'm not sure why they happen. Um, I found some reports that state that up to 80% remain idiopathic, so I assume that is based upon the institution. Um, Approximately 6 to 14% of patients with acute ischemic strokes will have recurrent strokes. There's a 20 to 40% mortality, which I was very surprised by. Most of those are with hemorrhagic stroke. Again, maybe I'm not seeing those kids because they're being managed by other people. And then 50 to 80% have neurologic sequela. But that means that 20 to 50% don't, which is pretty good. So the epidemiology of stroke in children, um, as you see, close to 800,000 American strokes per year. Um, for children, it's anywhere from 2 to 12 
per 100,000 for children, you know, per 100,000 children per year. Um, most of the most of the reports that I read said around 2%, so I'm not sure about the 12. Um, but certainly it, was, it would seem a little more than two per 100,000 uh, that we see. Uh, but then again, we see a, a large population here. It's a lot more common in newborns. Out of every 4,000 newborns, one of them will have a stroke. Most of those are ischemic as opposed to the rest of the general um, childhood stroke population. Uh, again, 50% roughly ischemic versus hemorrhagic. There's a male predominance for stroke in children. There's also a predominance for African-American children. Stroke is the sixth leading cause of death in children, so we certainly want to take it seriously and make people aware about stroke in children. And the peak age for stroke in children is in the first year of life. So when I put this differential diagnosis together, of course this is a short differential diagnosis, but nonetheless, um, there are some other things that you should think about. But I just want to tell you a quick little case presentation that I had. I had a patient who came to see me. He was, oh, a year and a half, Caucasian male, no prior medical history. He had been playing outside. He ran and tripped, and when he got up, he was hemiparetic. And um, this lasted, mm, let's say, about an hour. By the time I saw him, his exam was completely normal. Nothing else was going on. Nobody really knew what had happened at this point. And so I talked to the mom, and I remember telling her, well, you know, he could have had a hemiplegic migraine, maybe. Never, you know, he's never had this before, but that's a possibility. He could have had a seizure, and you didn't see it. And then he had a postictal Todd's paralysis. He could have fallen, caused a little bit of a dissection, could have caused a TIA or a stroke. Um, and, uh, you know, perhaps this is an alternating hemiplegia of childhood. Maybe this is his first presentation. So I talked about a few of those things. And so we got an MRI, and sure enough, it did not show stroke, but it did show Sturge Weber. So I've learned to put that in my diagnosis um, for these kids. He had no port wine stain, so he was one of those few cases that had this uh, Sturge Weber without the port wine stain. And so he had this transient hemiparesis. So they feel like stroke is on the rise in children. Perhaps these may be some of the reasons. Um, of course, when you see these, this list, you think of adults because these are pretty common in adults who have uh, stroke. Not as common in children, but nonetheless, these things are on the rise in children. So hypertension, tobacco, alcohol, and drugs, diabetes, obesity, hypercholesterolemia. So now we're going to go to the risk factors of stroke. Again, this is a very broad and long list. Um, I know this list itself doesn't look that long, but each of them individually have many uh, different applications. So congenital heart disease or acquired heart disease, systemic vascular disease, vasculitis, vasculopathies, metabolic disorders, vasospastic disorders, hematologic disorders, congenital cerebrovascular anomalies, trauma, and iatrogenic. So here we go. Um, and so for the congenital heart diseases, which tend to be the most common reason for stroke in children, aortic stenosis, atrial septal defects, cardiac rhabdomyomas, coarctation of the aorta, different complex congenital heart defects, mitral stenosis, mitral valve prolapse, patent ductus arteriosus, and a ventricular septal defect. So those are things that you want to look for when you have a kid presenting with stroke. There could be acquired heart disease that gives the kid a stroke. So different arrhythmias, atrial myxoma, bacterial endocarditis, cardiomyopathy, Lindman Sachs endocarditis, myocardial infarction, myocarditis, prosthetic heart valve, and rheumatic heart disease. And I'm not reading all these to bore you guys, but just to bring it to light, there are so many different reasons that kids can have stroke. And so when you're seeing a kid with stroke, it's not always easy to just look at them and then the first, in your first 20 minutes say, okay, I know why you had a stroke. But you kind of have to think about all the different various reasons that they may have them. Atherosclerosis, again, less likely in children. Diabetes, familial hypercholesterolemia, progeria, superior vena cava syndrome systemic hypertension or hypotension, volume depletion, 
vasculitides, bichettes, HIV, dermatomyositis, drug abuse, granulomatous angiitis, inflammatory bowel disease, varicella is a very popular one in the literature, tachyosseous arteritis, Kawasaki's disease, mixed connective tissue disease, bucor, polyarteritis nodosa, primary cerebral angiitis, rheumatoid arthritis, Nedden syndrome, SLE, meningitis. <coughs> you guys getting the picture yet? Um, some vasculopathies, Down syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, Febreze disease, malignant atrophic papulosis, Williams syndrome, Moya Moya, neurofibromatosis, pseudoxanthoma elasticum, and then, of course, spontaneous arterial dissection. <coughs> there are different metabolic diseases, homocysteine urea, isovaleric acidemia, um, the mitochondrial melos, methylmalonic and propionic acidemia, and then NADH CoQ reductase deficiency and ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. And it keeps going. Hazospastic disorders. So here's your alternating hemiplegia of childhood, which could predispose to stroke, as well as migraine, primary cerebral vasospasm, and vasospasm due to subarachnoid hemorrhages. This list, of course, is long, and you guys know this because with a lot of patients that you may see that have strokes, you hear about the hypercoag workup. So, of course, this is a long one. The anti-cardiolipin antibodies, antiphospholipid antibodies, antithrombin-3 deficiency, congenital coagulation defects, disseminated intravascular coagulation, Fanconi anemia, hemoglobinopathy such as sickle cell disease, um, thalassemia, hemolytic uremic syndrome, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, leukemia or other neoplasms, liver dysfunction with coagulation defects, lupus anticoagulant, nephrotic syndrome, oral contraceptive pills, it keeps going, protein C deficiency, protein S deficiency, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, polycythemia. Of course, people who are pregnant or postpartum are more at risk for strokes, vitamin K deficiency, systemic infection, thrombocytosis, thrombocytopenia with absent radius syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, and then twin-twin transfusion syndrome. We're getting close to the end of that part. Congenital cerebrovascular anomalies, arterial fibromuscular dysplasia, agenesis or hypoplasia of vascular channels, AV malformations, cavernous malformations, hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasias, intracranial aneurysm, and there's your Sturge-Weber syndrome. Trauma. In my personal experience, I've found that several of my patients have had some sort of trauma prior to their stroke. Blunt cervical arterial trauma, minor trauma with coagulation disorder, dissection with minor trauma, fat or air embolism, fibrocartilaginous embolism, foreign body embolism, penetrating intracranial trauma, intraoral trauma. They mentioned suckers and pencils in kids. Post-traumatic arterial dissection, post-traumatic carotid cavernous fistula, and child abuse. I just want to point out the minor trauma. Um, so it's very important if anyone is seeing a pediatric stroke that they inquire about minor trauma. Um, we've had children who have been jumping on the trampoline and landed a little bit funny um, that come in with TIA-type symptoms. So um, it doesn't have to be anything extreme, a car accident or anything like that. You just definitely need to ask about different types of um, neck injuries. There are, of course, iatrogenic causes of pediatric stroke, whether it's anticoagulation, arteriography, balloon angioplasty, bone marrow transplant, cardiac surgery, ECMO, umbilical artery embolization, chemotherapy with thrombocytopenia, chiropractic manipulation, L asparaginase therapy, maternal anticonvulsants, post irradiation, and temporal artery embolization. Okay, that was a big list, right? So we're dealing with a lot when we see pediatric strokes. There's a lot going through our mind. We have to do a lot of tests, but we can't do all these tests on everyone. So you definitely have to think about things and um, work patient by patient. Excuse me. Endosparginase uh, would be a nice example of a venous uh, 
cause for a ischemic stroke. It That's causes correct. a hyperthrombotic state and venous thrombosis. And um, that's seen a lot with the children with leukemia. Um, signs and symptoms. And some of this sounds very obvious, right? When you think of a stroke, you think of hemiparesis or numbness on one side of the body. You think of aphasia, ataxia even. In children, a lot of times their seizures could present with seizure or vomiting or, um, of course, the sudden severe headache, dysarthria, visual disturbances, vertigo. And so in infants, you got to think about just extreme sleepiness that makes you think something's going on with the brain. Another important point here is this early handedness. Um, just yesterday, I saw a child in the clinic who came to see me two years and a few months. And this kid was previously healthy, but the parents report that they noticed at a, before 12 months that she had early handedness. She wanted to use her left hand more than the right hand. And the reason they realized it was before 12 months is because they went for their 12-month checkup. They circled some things on the sheet, that, you know, just kind of asking questions. Does your child have early handedness? And they circled yes, but nothing really came of that. They went to their 18-month checkup, and they had really been noticing it since they had circled it that time and kind of talked to the pediatrician about it. Yeah, she's using her left hand a lot more than the right hand. Okay, we'll just watch and see. So at two-year checkup... They tell the pediatrician again, yeah, she doesn't really use her right hand. Oh, well, I guess since it's not improving, maybe you should get some therapy and see a neurologist. I'm glad they did, but they should have done that at 12 months. Um, I just now sent her for an MRI, so I don't know what it's going to show. Perhaps it shows that she had an early stroke. Maybe she had a different kind of brain malformation. But nonetheless, it's so important to recognize these things early, to initiate therapy early, to give that child the best outcome possible. History and physical. Of course, I left this slide blank. You guys all know the importance of history and physical with every patient, um, but it's extremely important, of course, in a stroke patient. Again, you want to know about the history of trauma. You want to know about the birth history, um, anything about the pregnancy and the delivery. You want to know about the family history, where there are people with young stroke in the family, where there are people with early death that was unexplained, early myocardial infarction, um, where there are people in the family with lots of DVTs or pulmonary embolisms or um, m multiple miscarriages. So definitely need to elicit a very good thorough history. Also, you know, have they been hospitalized for different types of things that might point us towards one of our differentials? Um, have they, um, you know, had any other kind of surgeries or are they any, on any other kind of medications? Do they have leukemia? Have they been getting the L asparaginase, et cetera? So very, very important to do that. With your physical exam, obviously you want to do a very thorough neurologic exam, including the fundoscopic exam to look for signs of increased intracranial pressure. You want to look at their skin, look for uh, the neurophacomatoses. So, you know, are there any signs there pointing towards surge web or neurofibromatosis or anything like that? So moving on to a workup for a patient with a stroke. So a stat head CT is reasonable to look for any signs of bleeding. Um, again, at that point, I would be calling my neurosurgery colleagues. Uh, an MRI of the brain is important because CTs don't always show acute strokes, right? For 12 hours, you may not see a change on the CT when there's actually an ischemic stroke. So an MRI is very important with your diffusion weight and images in ADC. MRA of the head and neck is very important um, because you want to uh, appreciate if there's any changes in the vasculature, any signs of dissection, vasculitis, vasculopathy, um, AVMs, go on, you know, and so on and so forth. Sometimes our MRAs come back normal, but we still have a high index of suspicion that something may be wrong, and so we'll go on for a CTA of the head and neck if that hasn't already been done. And then sometimes you need to think even if those things look negative, you may need to do a formal angiogram. People are sometimes reluctant to do formal angiograms in children, but um, sometimes it's necessary. You want to look at the heart. We've already mentioned with our risk factors of all the different heart defects that could cause problems. So in adults, they often will do the um, transesophageal echocardiogram to get a very good look at the heart 
looking for PDAs and thrombi, et cetera. A lot of times in children, we'll only do a transthoracic echocardiogram, but we'll do it with a bubble study that helps pick up PDAs um, and PFOs. Um, so sometimes, though, that still isn't good enough, and we'll talk with the cardiologist and we'll say, you know, how sure are you that you've got a very good view of this heart and that you feel confident in your findings? Um, and do you think we need to go through with a TEE? So sometimes if you find a PFO, you're going to want to do um, bilateral lower extremity Dopplers to look for signs of thrombus. You, of course, want to do your hypercoagulable workup, which we'll expand upon in a minute. You want to look at the coax, um, fasting lipid panel. You may consider doing a spinal tap to look for signs of vasculitis or infection. And then very rarely would you do a brain biopsy. I haven't yet ordered one of those, but um, it's mentioned. So your hypercoagulable workup, protein C, protein S, prothrombin gene mutation, antithrombin 3, antiphospholipid antibody, factor 5 Leiden, MTHFR, anticardiolipid antibodies, anti-beta 2 glycoprotein, lipoprotein A. And other people have a few others on their list as well, which may be important. Of course, depending on some of these, you can get the labs back and make decisions based upon that. A vasculitis workup, this is, again, some more basic things. It's not something that you do on every patient. Again, depending on who you're seeing and what the history and physical are like, ESR, CRP, ANA, complement levels, Cianca, Pianca, ACE, anti-centromere antibody, immunoglobulins, cryoglobulins, and the Coombs test. So what do we do? Okay, we've diagnosed them with a stroke. How do we treat them? It's probably a good idea to keep the head of the bed flat to just allow um, good perfusion of the brain. Permissive hypertension might not be a bad idea um, to allow the penumbra to be um, perfused with good oxygen. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with penumbra, it's essentially um, once you've had an ischemic infarct, there are areas that are kind of in danger of being infarcted, but they aren't quite there yet. And so if you can get enough blood and oxygen to those areas, you might salvage them. Um, another thing I want to say about this slide, um, some of it was just off the top of my head what we do, and others were things that I found in the literature. But I just want to say that sometimes the literature was a little bit frustrating because they would do all these studies or they would write this very nice paper, and their conclusions and their recommendations were kind of... Um, common sense, and so um, it was a little bit frustrating that there wasn't a little more, this is what you do and this is why you do it, such as they would say, it's reasonable if a patient has hypoxemia to give them oxygen. Okay, so um, those are the kind of things that are out there. So it's good to make them MPO until they have a swallow study. It may not be obvious that they're having problems swallowing until you actually look for it, and so you don't want to give them an aspiration and another problem on top of their stroke. You want to correct their hypoxemia. DVT prophylaxis, you got to consider that for kids or, um, who are going to be in the bed for a long time. You want to watch for frequent neuro checks. Is this kid going to stroke again? Is this kid going to have some cerebral edema in the next three days that's going to cause worsened problems? Are they going to have seizures? And so you really want to watch them closely. You may want to start your antiplatelets, anticoagulation, or TPA even. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Consider steroids or cytotoxic agents if you're concerned for vasculitis. You may want to do calcium channel blockers if you're concerned for vasospasm. You want to correct for hypoglycemia and hyperthermia and anemia. Again, something else it's reasonable to consider from that literature. So if you find an MTHFR mutation during all those blood works, or excuse me, throughout your blood work, you may want to do folate and um, some B vitamins. <laughs> If you have sickle cell disease, you want to go in and start hydration and exchange transfusion. Um, if you find a kid with moya moya, um, and that essentially, uh, again, it's a considered puff of smoke, and it's essentially there's some stenosis usually around the carotid vessel, uh, and you get lots of collateral vessels in the brain. And so when you look with a formal angiogram, it just looks like this puff of smoke. Uh, so there are multiple revascular techniques one can consider for that. Typically, after a kid has a stroke, it's a good idea to do neuropsych testing uh, 
There are a lot of cognitive impairments and things, and we're going to touch on that a bit later as well. So that's something to keep in mind. Very, very important. PT, OT, ST. Um, this is going to help those neural pathways get connected again. Extremely important. So if you're concerned about dissections, uh, sometimes it's not easy to find whether you're doing the MRA or the CTA. Sometimes even with formal angiogram, you don't see it, but you're still very suspicious based upon the history. If it's an extracranial arterial dissection, you either want to do unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin as a bridge to your oral anticoagulation. Um, and then for the next three to six months, you can consider either aspirin, low, mole excuse me, low molecular weight heparin, or warfarin. But if it's an intracranial dissection, anticoagulation is not recommended due to the risk of a bleed. And so if you found a child with cardiac emboli, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin as a bridge to warfarin, or continue the low molecular weight heparin for one year, or even indefinitely. Suspected cardiac emboli. So you haven't proven your point, but you really feel like it's a cardiac emboli. Then you want to do aspirin for a year. Uh, if there's a large ASD, you want to close that. Uh, if the anticoagulation therapy uh, is not indicated in native valve endocarditis, PFOs are not necessarily recommended to be closed. <clears throat> So in patients with the hypercoagulable state, you want to keep that in mind. Even if you find another reason that the kid probably had a stroke, you still want to look for these reasons because um, some of the more common prothrombotic states can make you more susceptible to having a stroke with minor trauma or something else in that realm. You want to be sure you discontinue oral contraceptive pills in patients with um, ischemic stroke or with sinus thrombosis. You want to treat your elevated homocysteine level with folate, vitamin B6, vitamin B12. So neonatal strokes, of course, supportive care. Again, who knew that one? Um, you want to consider hematoma evacuation if there's significantly elevated intracranial pressure. You want to consider a ventricular drainage, a VP shunt, unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Um, especially if there are multiple thrombi. Correct markedly low platelet counts and factor deficiencies. Again, more stuff that you might have thought of on your own. Consider vitamin K if the mother was on warfarin, phenytoin, or barb barbiturates. And then going, for for, excuse me, going forward in life, you want to consider constraint therapy. Um, the thing about children, babies especially, when they get strokes or when they get damage to their brain, a lot of times the plasticity of their brain really helps to compensate for the damage. And so just because they have a stroke in the area that controls the motor on the right side doesn't mean that they're going to be hemiparetic for life. They make new connections and they can really compensate for that. Constraint therapy really helps in this regard. You constrain their left side, their left arm specifically, with a splint or a cast or a mitten or whatever it is that is appropriate for that child, and that forces them to use the right side. Frustrates them because they want to use the hand that they know they can use, but that helps to reconnect those wires and to help them to really um, do the best in life. For instance, the child I told you about earlier that I saw yesterday, I did recommend that for this patient as well. So if you have a patient with a, a cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, obviously you want to hydrate them well. You want to be sure that you treat seizures. You want to lower the elevated intracranial pressure. You want to consider unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin, followed by warfarin uh, for three to six months. Most of these recommendations, by the way, are from um, <clears throat> the American Heart Association. Um, they're recommendations for uh, pediatric stroke treatment. Consider a thrombolytic agent. Do a CBC. Treat suspected bacterial infections with antibiotics. 
monitor visual fields and visual acuity, <coughs> and repeat neuroimaging to assess for recanalization or recurrence. <clears throat> so in general, you want to do anticoagulation if you're concerned about arterial dissection, a coagulopathy, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, or a concern for recurrent emboli risk. <clears throat> if you wanted to use heparin, <coughs> excuse me, you would want to load with 75 units per kilogram IV, followed by 20 units per kilogram per hour for kids who are over a year of age. But for kids under a year of age, you want to use 28 units per kilogram. You want to target the APTT for 60 to 85 seconds. If you wanted to use Lovenox, you could use a milligram per kilogram per dose, subcutaneous twice daily. Um, or for neonates, 1.5 milligrams per kilogram. If you use warfarin, you want your goal INR to be 2 to 3, and that's with your native heart valves. <clears throat> so prophylactic management. Again, low molecular weight um, heparin for high risk of recurrent cardiac thrombus, sinus venous thrombosis or a severe coagulation disorder. You want to use aspirin for others. And so the ranges on that, uh, this particular study had mentioned three to five mg per kg per day. I saw another study that said down to two mg per kg per day. Um, however, if they're symptomatic from the aspirin, you can consider going down to one milligram per kilogram per day. <clears throat> so far, there have been no reports of a patient who is on prophylactic aspirin for stroke prophy prophylaxis um, there have been no reports of those people, children, getting Rye syndrome. There was a report of an elderly person who um, I believe had the flu, took extra aspirin, um, and then got Rye syndrome. So what's the outcome of pediatric stroke? Well, of course, they could have hemiparesis afterwards. They certainly could have neuropsychological deficits. A lot of times they have impaired concentration and attention. They have problems with their memory. They have problems with their behavior. And they have problems with their cognition. Um, however, we also see patients who have a stroke one day, and by the end of the week, they're back to baseline. Um, so in children, it's just really hard to tell. And so I'm going to look at some of the trials. The STOP trial, that's uh, been long uh, decided. It's um, we're, oh, we're going to talk about that in a second. And so another trial we'll look at is the aspirin versus low dose, low molecular weight heparin, uh, an antithrombotic treatment in pediatric ischemic stroke patients. We're also going to look at some of the literature on thrombolysis for children with acute ischemic stroke, a perspective from the kids in patient database, endovascular treatment of children with cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, a case series, cognitive outcomes following arterial ischemic stroke in infants and children, and thrombolysis and childhood stroke, report of two cases and review of the literature. So the STOP trial. was stroke prevention trial in sickle cell anemia. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this trial already, but it was a consortium of 14 clinical centers. It was a randomized control trial to test repeated transfusion to, pre to prevent a first stroke. So there were 130 patients enrolled who had elevated velocity detected on transcranial Doppler. They got regular transfusions to reduce the hemoglobin S from 90 to 30, and that resulted in a significant decrease in the stroke risk. There was a 90% reduction in stroke rate that resu resulted in early termination of the trial. So they said, you know what? It's not even right to keep the other kids from getting these transfusions, so we're going to stop the trial, and that's going to be our recommendations for sickle cell patients. Then there was the aspirin versus low-dose, low-molecular weight heparin, Antithrombotic treatment in pediatric ischemic stroke patients. They looked at 135 children with their first ischemic stroke, ages 6 months to 18 years, and they followed them up for a median of 36 months. There was recurrent stroke at a median of 5 months in 9.6% of the patients. Um, and then there was no significant difference in outcome from either treatment arm. So was this irrespective of the etiology of the stroke? Or? Yeah, well, I, um, yeah. I see. For those aspirin they used, they used the tuberculin for that dose of aspirin? I didn't write it down, so I don't recall. Again, I read several different articles that use different doses, so I'm not sure on that one. Stopped. 
Um, the thrombolysis for children with acute ischemic stroke, a perspective from the kids and patient database. It was a retrospective study looking from 1998 to 2009. 9,257 children with a diagnosis of stroke. 67 of them received thrombolysis. <clears throat> so the unadjust <coughs> unadjusted analysis showed a higher hospital mortality, 10.45% versus 6.14. And then intracerebral hemorrhages, 2.99 versus 0.77. Um, so the conclusion was that mortality and hemorrhage rate are similar to that in adults who get TPA. Then there was the endovascular treatment of children with cerebral venous thrombosis, a case series. It was a retrospective review of nine cases of um, sinus thrombosis that did, not or, yeah, that did not improve with heparin from 18 months to 16 years of age. They used endovascular techniques, local TPA, micro guide wire and catheter disruption, balloon angioplasty, and thromboaspiration using the penumbra device. Eight of those children had good clinical outcome, and one died, but that was due to increased intracranial pressure, not necessarily due to the um, intervention performed. So their conclusion was that endovascular therapy, here's another frustrating thing that we see a lot in the pediatric literature, may have a role <clears throat> in the treatment of cerebral venous sinus thromboses in children when medical therapy has failed and the patient is in poor clinical condition. The cognitive outcomes following arterial ischemic stroke in infants and children. There were 36 children with perinatal or childhood arterial ischemic stroke compared with 15 asthma patients. <clears throat> they felt like people in the past had just compared these children to otherwise normal children, normal healthy children, so they wanted somebody who had some kind of a chronic medical condition to look at. <clears throat> so the children with arterial ischemic stroke performed significantly below normative populations and the asthma group on inhibitory control. And children with ischemic stroke fell at the low range of average on measures of cognitive function. There was the thrombolysis in childhood stroke report of two cases in review of the literature. So this is 17 patients overall through the literature who had received IV um, TPA or intraarterial TPA and um, mechanical thrombo thrombolysis. So in this, there were no symptomatic um, bleeds in the brain. Um, there were two that were um, asymptomatic. Six of the patients got TPA within three hours. Five of those had a good outcome, and one had a poor outcome. There were three who got intraarterial TPA for MCA occlusion within six hours, complete resolution in one, some improvement in one, and death in one with a carotid T occlusion. Um, there were seven intraarterial TPAs for basilar artery occlusion. Three of those had locked in syndrome, and four had altered consciousness and focal neurologic deficits. So, four hours and 50 minutes, they started doing this at four hours and 50 minutes after the onset, up to 72 hours. Um, Additional balloon angioplasty occurred with three of the patients. There was complete resolution in four patients. Minimal symptoms in one, moderate neurologic symptoms in one, and severe neurologic sequela in one. It's certainly something to think about. Um, one thing I would like to say about um, this kind of trial with whether it's TPA or, um, you know, intervention um, interventional radiology or um, any of these kind of treatments, obviously they, they can occur or they can result with some good outcomes. Uh, but sometimes our kids, even with big looking bad strokes, have good outcomes anyway. So that just makes it all the more confusing in pediatric stroke. So the TIPS trial. I was really excited about this trial. I learned about it a couple years ago at the AAM meeting in Hawaii. Um, when they talked about thrombolysis and pediatric stroke. And so they were going to do this five-year, multi-center, international safety and dose-finding study for IV TPA and acute ischemic stroke to determine the maximum safe dose of IV TPA among three doses, 0 0.75, 0 0.9, and one milligram per kilogram for children ages 2 to 17 who presented within four and a half hours with an acute ischemic stroke. 
sounded great because then we can finally know, is it safe to give TPA? Is it warranted to give TPA? Um, however, it was terminated because they could not get enough patients. Um, so that's kind of frustrating, but um, perhaps they may try again in the future. I don't know. It's a, it's a difficult thing because, you know, when I look back at the last 19 years of being in Louisville, I don't know that I've really ever seen a pediatric patient who would be a, been a clear-cut candidate for the, for, you know, EPA. So it's, these patients have to show up within a certain time frame and, uh, and you don't, you know, do it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you can get a little overzealous uh, also. So mm -hmm. I think I can see why this happened, actually. There are a lot of um, confounding factors. Um, one, people just don't realize that kids can have strokes. They don't go straight to the emergency room when their child has this sudden neurologic deficit like they would if they were an adult. So sometimes you have patients that come two or three days later with hemiparesis, and you're thinking, and you just sat home. Um, so that happens a lot. Uh, you don't have the medical professional professionals that realize, hey, we should be acting upon this. This looks like stroke. You know, they admit them, we'll get a test tomorrow, those kind of things. You also find a lot in the literature that people are trying TPA much later than the recommended doses for adult, or excuse me, the recommended time frame um, than what they do for adults because of this. Um, again, you have the kids that recover well without intervention. Sometimes it's hard to get an MRI to prove that they've had a stroke because with MRI, you have to be still, and you have to be still for about 30 minutes, and kids often won't be. So they require sedation, and they've already eaten McDonald's. So uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to prove that they've had a stroke in a timely manner and to get them treatment. And then, you know, if you have a parent that you're wanting to enroll in the TIPS program here, you tell them, hey, this is a potentially life-threatening treatment because you got to tell them the facts. And they say, well, I don't want to do that to my child, or I don't want my kid to be a guinea pig. Um, and so it's very, I can imagine that it is very hard to get patients to sign up for this. Um, so I like this quote, so I'm just going to read it to you. No randomized controlled treatment trials have been completed in children with stroke. Many of the procedures increasingly used in children with cerebrovascular disease have been adapted from studies in adults. Accumulating experience with antithrombotic and anticoagulant treatment in children suggest that these agents can be safely used in children. Though their efficacy and proper dose still need to be established by controlled trials. Thrombolytic agents should be as effective in children as in adults, but the safety data are inadequate for children and the timing and dosage need to be determined for children and adolescents. So that pretty much sums up the literature for pediatric stroke. Um, something else I just wanted to point out to you guys, there's transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is a relatively safe, non-invasive technique to help stimulate the cerebral cortex. And so at higher, frequen higher frequencies, it's been shown to stimulate the corticospinal tract. And so there are suggestions that perhaps you use this with constraint therapy that I already mentioned or behavioral therapy to get even better results. So just a few case studies before we wrap up. Um, so this particular child is um, an 18-month-old, previously healthy Caucasian male who came to see us. He um, had an acute right-sided hemiparesis and aphasia. And it went away within 12 hours, and his MRI was normal. But then a few days later, he had acute decompensation with desaturations and unresponsiveness. A rapid response was called, and I was called to his bedside, and I came up to see that he was seizing. His head was deviated to the right. His eyes were deviated to the right. He had already been given Advan. It had stopped for a while, but then it started again. And then it stopped and it started again. And so he got treated for seizure and he got down for an MRI and we found this. And so this is a diffusion weighted image, um, an axial plane of this child. Um, and you guys can appreciate hyperintensity here, right? So this is on the left side. And then we're going on up. And you can see this here, a little bit here in the thalamus, there. And to be quite honest, Two days later, this was gone. His MRI was normalized. He had no neurologic deficits. 
So what was going on here? Was it postictal edema? Was it a reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome? Um, was it vasculitis? Um, we've worked them up quite thoroughly. We still don't have an exact answer, but um, I just thought that was an interesting case to bring up. Uh, we have another one. Case, can we, can we go sure. Back um, so on the adult side, Dr. Emil, would you have, uh, if this person was not showing any overt neurological deficit, uh, would this person have, and was within the three-hour time window, would he have got TPA? Not if there's a, not a measurable deficit. So that's why we decided not to give this child TPA, because he did not have a measurable deficit. But we came very, very close, uh, probably the closest uh, you know we have in many years to giving somebody TPA, because we actually got a hold of this within two hour and a half hours, because this happened while the child was in the hospital. But we opted not to give TPA because there was no measurable deficit. And it was hard to say if there was measurable deficit because he was postictal too. So he presented with seizure, which is a, a potential contraindication for TPA. But he well, it's a relative relative. But, um, but the but the other thing you have to think about is the diffusion abnormality in seizure. Mm -hmm. Right. The postictal edema that can occur. Right. Stroke plus seizure breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Exactly. In the seizures. And so that was a, another factor in my mind for holding off. Unfortunately, what complicated things in this child is that he had had a TIA before this. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, the whole seizure. You're thinking thing, stroke. That's right. So At that the becomes onset of seizure. more difficult then. Yeah. Do you see press the seizure the in children? We do All see press in children, yes. Um, we. Can it be unilateral like this? Um, it can be. It's usually bilateral. It often affects the frontal lobes also, um, and it can be seen on diffusion, but usually the diffusion changes in press tend to be um, more permanent sequela and more permanent neurologic um, deficits. But you have to have risk factors for that and, you know, Reverse. appropriate risk factors. So in pediatrics, it's usually in our patients receiving, uh, you know, hydrosteroids and immunosuppressants and uh, hypertensive, not, not my, absent that, we never see it, never. So in this child, that was not even a consideration because he, was, he was, didn't have any risk factors at all for press. The next case was a, a teenage girl. She was a Caucasian female, and she came in. She had woken up in the middle of the night, and her hand um, all of a sudden felt numb. And... Uh, she came to see us, and actually went to, she went to the ER, and the ER called neurology and said, hey, we have a girl down here with conversion disorder. She says that her hand is numb. She's fine. You know, she's shaking her hand some, doesn't look real. She's walking funny. Um, can we send her home? And our nurse practitioner said, no, <laughs> you can't. If you're telling me that she had an acute onset of numbness, we need to see her. And so we see her the next day. And most of her exam looks okay. She is kind of, um, I think she's kind of jerking her hand, but it, that's kind of intermittent and kind of changes in its uh, velocity and frequency and amplitude. Yeah, I wasn't so sure about that jerking of the hand. Um, she said her hand was numb. Okay, so maybe. But really on her exam, um, the only thing that we noticed, we had her put her hands out and we had her close her eyes. And she kind of did this. And she didn't know to drift her hand. So we said, yeah, let's get an MRI on this girl. And so we did. Um, and so you can see right here, and then moving on up, right there. And keep going. You can see. Oh, wait a minute. Wrong kid. All right, back to her. Um, I was going to say. <laughs> I was like, um, And so... Um, she, sure enough, <coughs> had a stroke. Um, afterwards, though, things did get confusing because then she started walking uh, like this, which wasn't from a stroke. Uh, <laughs> but it's hard to tell mom that that's not from a stroke because she doesn't believe you. So we're working on it. But um, she's getting better. She walks normal if she has a cane. So we, we have her a cane. Happy about that. All right, moving on um, to our two-year-old patient. Um, let me think here which two-year-old patient this was. Um, oh, yes. Okay. 
So this was a two-year-old Caucasian female, no prior previous history. Um, she was at the gym with her mother. Uh, her mom was working out. She and her brother were playing like they always do. They bumped heads. They cried. They got better. She went to play on this swing-like apparatus, and she grabbed on, and mom saw her fall. She probably hit her head on the, the gym floor, which is that kind of rubbery mat kind of surface. She cried. Mom swept her up, took her, held her, consoled her. She calmed down. She said, I want to go play. And mom said, well, if you can walk over there, you can do it. Well, she started walking, and she was hemiparotic. And so um, she was kind of you know, dragging her leg and didn't really use her arm. So mom thought, oh, this sounds a little scary. We should probably go to the hospital. So they went to the ER, got some IV fluids, and she started to look better. She was using both sides equally, and she looked great. So the ER calls neurology and says, hey, we got this girl. This is her history. She looks pretty good. We're thinking about sending her home. We said no. And so they send her to us, and um, by the time she comes to us, she's not moving her um, left side again. And um, then she starts to move it again while we're in the room. But at any rate, we get an MRI, and you can see this on the diffusion. So she, in fact, had a stroke. Um, fortunately, after she got admitted um, and worked up and managed, she left that week, was walking, talking, doing everything just fine, back to her baseline. So again, um, you can see it was pretty impressive. So, Dr. Eret, are you saying that if you have a focal neurological deficit, you shouldn't go to the ER? Or? <laughs> if you or anyone you know has a focal neurologic <laughs> deficit, go to the ER immediately, please. Um, and make sure that they call neurology. Um, so, this one's a 12 month old white female. I saw this girl a couple of years ago. She had been in an outside hospital pretty sick. Um, and. They were kind of treating her a little bit, and I think they maybe gave her a day of antibiotics, and she kind of got to the point where she wasn't really waking up. And so they said, well, maybe we should send her to Cosair. So they sent her to Cosair to the floor, um, to the non-unit side of things, and she still wasn't really waking up, and she was starting to go downhill. So they got a stat CT, and they saw some blood and some herniation, and they thought they would call neurology and the PICU. Um, so they transferred her to the PICU, and I was driving there thinking this girl is going to die tonight, and she didn't, which is good. But by the time I got there, I saw this MRI. And so you can appreciate here on the left um, all these diffusion changes, a little bit on the right, but really impressive on the left. And so she had fever. She um, was herniating. She... Um, was just extremely sick. I don't remember all the other details of her presentation other than she was really, really sick. Uh, but it, it turns out oops, that she had um, HSV encephalitis. And um, 12 months old, previously healthy. Her dad had had a cold sore, and he kissed her. Is that how he, she got it? Maybe? Probably? Um, she actually ended up with that terrible-looking brain she survived. She came to see me in a couple months, was walking, using her arm, starting to talk. So she was doing quite well then. But then she went on a year later to develop infantile spasms at the age of two. And then she developed some pretty um, severe epilepsy. Um, and then I handed her off to Dr. Karen <laughs> Shea when she came and said, why don't you help me with her epilepsy? So how's she doing now? <laughs> oh, okay, never mind. Oh. Figured oh, yeah, you would yeah, know yeah, this no, story right off. Well. She's doing yeah. well. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. fortunately she's doing pretty well now. So at any rate, those are just a few of our stroke cases. We see a lot of stroke <coughs> in pediatrics, a lot more than you would think. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you to Dr. Soul for helping me get some of this information. I want to say thank you for Dr. to Dr. Peary for teaching me about pediatric stroke and being available anytime I call with a complicated stroke patient to help me figure out what's the best way and to calm me down um, when I get a little nervous. And then Dr. Rimmel, of course, just laid the foundation for stroke for me when I worked with adult neurology during the fellowship, um, and she was always available 365 days a year, any hour of the day, um, whenever I had a question about a stroke, and so, um, and never once complained about it, always smiled. So thank you so much. And then Dr. Farber, of course, has answered several of my phone calls and questions as well. So uh, I appreciate you guys. Thank you all for being here today and for listening.
and um, that's all. I have a comment um, coming from the adult world, <laughs> Dr. Eric. Uh, we started out not being able to, to uh, complete trials in the beginning, can't get patients in on time, low numbers, uh, just very difficult uh, in the early days of stroke trials just because we, hear, we heard the same thing. Patients would stay home and or go to their primary care and just wouldn't get to the hospital early enough. And so just as time evolved and systems were put in place and communities were activated, um, we have been able to get patients in soon enough. So nationally, we still don't give IV TPA any more than uh, 5%, maybe four, 3 to 4% across the nation, so it's pretty bad. At UofL um, Hospital, it's 20% of all patients and for ischemic stroke and 100% um, of those that get there and fit the criteria. Uh, the bleed rate on the adult side at UofL for those patients, I think it was only 73 last year, uh, but was zero for symptomatic hemorrhage. And uh, for the transfers, which we had more transfers than we had TPA in-house, um, uh, it was 3% hemorrhage. So that's better than the, um, the national average or the NIH trials. But the key for children, I think, is we believe that it's beneficial but the problem is getting them, getting them there, and so the trials just can't continue. They can't go on forever. Yeah. Um, so I think something that you mentioned, you know, it's kind of education. So if we can get out there and educate the community, the parents, the teachers, the doctors, pediatricians, let them know the this is this is huge. This is important. It's I mean, a real. TPA is only one small aspect. As right. You, but with you, all the studies there, it's just hard to do. Yeah. Well, unlike, that the, was uh, unlike the adult side, one of the problems with pediatric trials is always going to be that uh, you, we are going to be very uncomfortable with having non tertiary care centers administer TPA to children. Right. So, you know, be, it's very difficult for us to try to give somebody TPA that's being managed by somebody elsewhere, unless it's an older child. So yeah, we we've can. given it to 15-year-olds, yes. one 15-year-old and uh, a couple of 17-year-olds at U of L. But, but yeah, it's very difficult, and in, in the it's it's just there are layers of complications. And then I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you very much for going through, uh, helping us understand how complicated this is, uh, because it is very complicated. Even on the adult side, there are many etiologies, and then when you start looking at all the metabolic disorders and other problems with children, it, it just gets very difficult. But thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I've had quite a few patients who uh, have a stroke, a history very good for dissection, but even on the formal angiogram, we still don't see dissection. So should our management be different for those patients? Um, again, not based on literature, but personally, I feel like those kids should get Lovenox um, and stay on it for several months. If Any, the history fits. How often do you guys see, you know, a picture that you think might fit a dissection, but you don't demonstrate it on vascular imaging? Yeah, so, um, of course, we'll do angio. And we have to see, I mean, we're not going to treat a dissection without a, um, a imaging that would show it. But without formal cerebral angiography? Yeah, if, if we have a high suspicion and we don't see it on CTA, then we'll go to uh, angio. But and some of the studies quite a few. I mean, we get we get vert and carotid dissections frequently. Some of the studies recommended just treating all comers, um, everyone with stroke with you know heparin or lovenox if they're not bleeding, um, early on for the first five to seven days until you have a better understanding about what caused it. And that's not what we do on the adult side because we have data that shows that at the end of two weeks, the number of strokes, recurrent strokes that you have in that population, the, the half that got heparin acutely had bleeds mm -hmm. and the half that didn't had some sort of recurrent 
stroke. So we do not, in the, on the adult side, automatically just treat with anticoagulation. It's, um, it's, you know, they're just, it's dangerous. And so did, with peds, it may be completely different. Getting back to TPA, it, you, you should be able to calculate some kind of an opportunity. Um, like if you knew how many people were ordinarily helped by early administration, uh, yeah. but don't get it, you know, what, yeah. what kind of a improvement you could get, if only, mm -hmm. and do you know what that is for pediatrics? No I'm idea. Any way to no, we thought, okay. but I, I, I don't know. Dr. Peary, do you have Very any few studies. That? I mean, it's just a few that showed. You showed one study. I was just going to comment on an, um, an N of one that I've had in my, my experience. About eight years ago, a six-year-old came in with dense hemiparesis and um, had TPA and um, had a 90% resolution of her symptoms. I had the opportunity to follow her for years afterwards. Um, and she was congenital heart disease, so it makes me, and she had stopped taking her aspirin. Mm. Um, and it makes me wonder if perhaps we should, you know, that's a huge population, it seems like, percentage-wise, of the, you know, high-risk kiddos. And maybe what we need to do is work with cardiology with early education, yeah. because we know out of that, you know, congenital heart disease population, there are going to be strokes, and maybe we need to target that education together with them to... Point. That's another real quick comment on the rehab side. You know, I've seen constraint boost uh, therapy work extremely well both in adults and kids. And as you mentioned, neuroplasticity is remarkable in children and they make great recoveries. Uh, we do have transcranial magnetic stem available to us at Fraser as well as uh, uh, tr uh, direct uh, um, transcranial direct stem. And I do think that there's going to be a place for that in the future from right. a standpoint of utilizing it uh, during acute and post acute rehab services potentially to, you know, um, improve the outcomes. Uh, again, no studies in the pediatric populations. Some studies starting to show up in the adult populations with some favorable outcomes. So we've got to figure out frequency, dose, and things like that. But certainly if it's something we want to look at here at UofL, we've got the capability. I'm actually, glad you there is some, uh, Thank you. There is uh, some pediatric work done, and actually there is some published literature on that with RTMS also. It's done by a guy called Adam Kirton, K I R T O N, in Calgary. And so he has, uh, he's been doing it for a few years. And he actually presented his data about a year, a year and a half back also. And that there is a reason to believe that it is, uh, you know, helpful. So there is some data emerging in Yeah, I really, based on what I've seen, I really firmly believe that there's going to be a point in the near future where when you come to the rehab unit with a stroke or any kind of uh, focal even maybe in some cases diffuse cerebral deficits that you'll be receiving some type of cortical stimulation as part of your rehab. So uh, it's exciting. Are you doing it right now, Frazier? We, we're not doing it during rehab, but we do have the, the ability there. We were doing some research in it. Dr. Boyachi has the equipment, and I've been talking to him recently about bringing that into the clinical realm because I think it would be interesting. And there are a few places, interestingly, our neighbors in Lexington. Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Thank you. Our, our friends in Lexington are actually starting to do it. So uh, it'd be interesting to even collaborate with them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.